Um, what a wonderful night. Thank you, Strand Bookstore. This is a bookstore that's, been, that's carried my first two novels up until this day. It's, uh, as the bookstore started to dwindle, uh, authors always go into these stores and, and look for their own stuff. And the str I would come and visit Manhattan and know that my two books were on the shelf here. So I, I love this store and I love this neighborhood too. Um, this is a, an interesting forum. Uh, there's so many different uh, styles of forums to read when you have a book come out. And I don't think Zach and I have ever sat on stage before. Uh, we did do an interview uh, when my first book came out and Garden State was out. Uh, um, and it was with the forward. And that was, uh, we were both on the phone. So being here and being able to look at you, I'm very excited to do this. We're gonna ask, we're gonna ask each other questions that we have not revealed to each other. <laughs> I'm actually a little fr afraid. My uh, questions were on my counter and I thought you looked at them. No, I passed but by. You promised that you didn't. Um, every, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, us as a family a little bit because um, we are, we, it's turning out we, we are artistic people. And we were not raised by um, professional artists. We were raised by a lawyer and a, and a student of psychology and then she became a psychologist, mom and dad. And um, before they split, there were four of us. It was Adam and then Josh and then Shoshana and then little Zachary. And when I was seven years old, or let's say, let's make it six, Zach's not with us yet. I, uh, I said to my mom, I, I'd like to write some, uh, I'd like to write a poem. And she said, terrific, let's do it. And I remember that my handwriting was either not up to snuff or something happened and she said, I I'll do the writing. And uh, this is about a, a mom who's supporting her artist son who, who would evolve into something that, um, wasn't predicted because there was some talk about maybe thinking about the law. Our name was on the law office that our father had and his father had it too. Uh, I'm not sure if he remembers but he did suggest it wouldn't be terrible if one of you came into the firm and, <laughs> and took over and at the time it wasn't silly, now it is, but um, so very supported by these parents. Um, dad loved to get in the car and bring us to Broadway shows and then discuss them and also to see all kinds of movies all over New Jersey. Didn't matter how far it was, you wanted to go to a double feature. Um, when it came time to um, talk about our careers, it wasn't necessarily go be artists, you know. Go, go in the basement and, and write a short story about the human condition. Uh, there, there wasn't any of that because there would be no money in that. What happened was, I, my mother said to me, these poems are beautiful. And I said to her, do you mind if I sing them? <laughs> and she said, I would love it if you'd sing them. And then I said, I'm embarrassed. You're my mom, we're alone, but I'm not gonna sing them. But it was an early sign of, I cared a lot about writing and in my education, if there were any kudos to be had, it was through the things I was able to put down uh, and that began to evolve. So we now cut to Adam Braff comes to me and says, I heard you did some writing. And I, cause I, I was now older and college age and I did some pieces that I thought I might send out. And whereas Zach got bit by the acting bug, I was bit by the notion of having a byline, having my name next to something that I produced. And um, Adam said, you know, I, I wanted to impress Adam, of course, and Adam said, these are really, really good. And I was thinking as uh, this week building up to this, what really turned it around for me? And there was this moment where I was um, in college and he took a look at these three pieces and just his reaction to them made me think, perhaps I do this better than the, the next guy. Perhaps my neighbor isn't looking into this kind of thing and if I hone it, we'll see what happens. Um, the next thing that happened not long after that was Zach was auditioning and he called and said, I got a Woody Allen movie. Before that it had been maybe a commercial. And that all of a sudden was the day that Zach Braff was gonna perhaps not be a doctor. Do you remember that? There was some talk, he was an EMT. Well, I, I was a doctor and director. <laughs> <laughs> not on TV. 
<laughs> Zach was uh, on the emergency squad, and there was some, you yeah. know, as I, as, and I thought, and he said, I don't know, maybe I'm considering, I remember thinking, that would be cool, I'd be proud of that. <laughs> I'm going to be in a Woody Allen movie. Now, I don't know if you remember color forms, but you'd take the little plastic strip and you'd put it into a different environment. That's what it felt like watching Manhattan Murder Mystery, the scene with Angelica Houston and Woody Allen, and there's little Zach coming up. And it was a day of improv. Uh, he said, there, he got there and Woody said, we sort of don't have a script, and you'll tell that. Maybe. No, we have a script. We're just not going to say anything that's in the script. <laughs> so he said, we just try and keep up. He, he, was, he was green at the time. And uh, it, the way he... Yeah, if, you, if you're interested, go back and watch the scene. I'm only on screen for about a minute. And now that you know the anecdote, watch. I look terrified. I, look, I can't believe I'm in a scene with these three people. And they're not saying any of the lines that are in the script that I've memorized. They're just sort of all improvising. And I have this look of sheer terror. <laughs> It was the begin beginning of, oh, wow, this, this, this was surreal and this could be this. So he's got this gig and he's going to pursue acting. And I decide that the books that my mother has been giving me, uh, they're human condition literature and they're collections of short stories. Um, I know that I read some Alice Munro. She gave me some Ethan Kanan. Um, and she, she loved this genre. And long story short, I ended up writing short stories um, that were in this vein. And um, I got to, I my, met my wife, Jill Braff, and she uh, and I moved from New York to Seattle. And we did this because this was pre Giuliani Manhattan, and we wanted to just. Uh, wake up to the sun a little bit more than we were. Manhattan's a different animal now. It's very, very inviting compared to the early, early, early 90s. And we said, all right, we're going to head that way. It's either going to be Portland or Seattle. End up in Seattle and end up taking a class in sh fiction. And that teacher um, became a mentor of mine. And he said, you're very good. And of course, uh, feedback is sort of everything when there's no money in the art form you're pursuing. It's all about, I feel this. I need to pursue this, I need to hone this, and hopefully there is support. And so this mentor said, how about an MFA? So Masters of Fine Arts, Creative Writing Fiction. I applied, I got into a school in the San Francisco area, and we moved. Um, it, while I was there, and uh, aiming to publish short stories in literary mags for the payment would be two copies of the literary journal, you know. I was really getting into the dough here, you know. Um, Zach, uh, not long after, said, I'm auditioning for a... Uh, a well, this was, this was not long after this. He was auditioning for uh, Scrubs. And he auditioned all the time. And um, there would be nibbles. And just like any art form where you're attempting to get something. Of course, there's a, good, there's a great nibble. The, you know, in my life, a, a magazine called Zizifa, a, li a literary journal, was like, if the editor writes the word onward on your rejection slip, send to them again, you know. And I was obsessed with this. So Zach uh, then calls and says, I got scrubs. Oh my God, you got scrubs. He's like, I've won the lottery. <laughs> and and you, when, when he came home and went to his upfront in New York and you saw his eyes, you were like, he's found, uh, his, he's found his way. Okay, first novel, J The Unthinkable Thoughts of Jacob Green comes out in 04, and so does Garden State. And um, I don't know if it, it was, I remember, I remember the New York Post interviewed my editor at Algonquin and, and it made it seem as though she was lying that we didn't attempt to line up the release of the book with the movie and it, it, it would be very hard to do. But um, that was an interesting year and um, Zach and I were under, underway for what we were going to be. And of course there was support from the parents and I was now not going to take the bar anymore. And <laughs> Um, there was enough attention from my first book to warrant, um, a, you know, let's, let's do another one. And so my life became um, aiming for that, for that second thing, so that second book. I want to say about Zach and I, um, seven years apart, um, we love 
uh, uh, this is something about us. We are observers. Um, if you were with us and we were out at a restaurant, it wouldn't be a matter of us staring at you and maybe writing some of the things you said down. It's almost as if I don't necessarily remember some of the specific things I'm hearing or observing, but in my work, the human condition, I, I want my characters to be speaking to the reader when they're not speaking. So hands and eyes and movement and what, what can I do physically without having my character speak that evokes who they are in a way that you might say, oh my god, that's, that's somebody I know. So that's one section of it is recognizing the movement of that person or, or subtleties like that. And then when they begin to talk, the, um, the dialogue, it, um, I'm, I'm successful at dialogue. I, don't, I didn't know why. I'm, it's part, part of the gift that I honed. So I guess I'm hearing well and I'm, once, if you're writing good dialogue, you are in the place to create dimension in those characters. And if those characters, the more dimension in those characters, the better because they're going to talk to each other and that's going to help dictate where you're headed if you're not outlined and you're, you're writing a piece of short fiction. Uh, short, short stories is a different energy to begin than, than a novel. And um, that's, that's an interesting difference. Zach and I um, have always been um, similar and close. Uh, we haven't lived in the same city probably ever for very long, but we, we love photography and documentaries. And I say that because uh, documentaries, there's so many of them. Uh, these days, there's, every, there's a beautiful selection of them, and it wasn't always the case. And it's also the access to them is so amazingly easy. It is safe observation of the human condition, the unscripted moments of people uh, living, uh, reacting to the challenges of their life. Um, I, I can't get enough. I, I, see, I don't see a ton of scripted movies that much anymore. Um, if I'm, a, if I'm uh, at home and it's, uh, I have a couple hours, I might say, let's just turn on that Apple TV and see that menu and see what's new. It's research, it, it's fodder, it's um, everything I need. At, at, when it's over, I don't necessarily go right, but I feel like I, my well is full um, with what I might take with me as tools into a place where you're using a black word on a white page for 300 pages or whatever. So. Um, Zach and I have that in common, and we've watched them together. We're both way into photography, which is also like documentary photography in a sense. Or um, you can, this is this may be, and I, uh, if you live here, it's hard to know this. This may be the best city in the world for observation. I'm not looking for applause um, because you know why. It's the the melting pot and the the social economic background and then the multi-millionaire that you can sort of smell as they pass you when you're uptown and then they're uh, on this street I, I feel I feel like I might belong on this street but I don't know so, so much if I belong on this one depending what I'm wearing or so it's fascinating and um, I, whenever I visit what happens is I put on my shoes and I start to walk I, I think a lot of people do that but I'm walking and walking walking I don't tire and I'm sweating and today was a beautiful day to do it um, I'm going to read to you a chapter um, from The Daddy Diaries. Um, this is my third novel. This book, I get to say, I've sold a couple other books, I get to say this with, with honesty that this book is about love. It is about marriage, it is about child rearing, and it's also about the love of close friends that you have as you grow and if you, you grow up with certain friends. and. I, I heard recently that when you're married, your, your spouse is, is a witness to your life. And I believe that I have, a, I have a clique of friends that I know, because I've been friends with them since Little League, that will be sitting there in our 70s, hopefully all of us in 80s, and we will talk about stuff that, we've, that happened to us in 1982. And um, I, feel, I feel great about that, and I wrote about that. Um, I am a stay-at-home dad, writer. Uh, my wife and I have two children. This summer they will be 15 and 12, a boy and a girl. And I was home and w uh, uh, hands-on, in the trenches, daddy, uh, di from, from diapers uh, to toddlers to what, what, the, what they're becoming now. And um, we had a, w the two of us, we decided to move um, 
not too long ago to Florida. <laughs> my wife took a job in Florida, and there I, be I said to myself, okay, with this family of four was lifted from the mentality of San Francisco and plopped in St. Petersburg, Florida. The kids are at their school, a little shell-shocked. The wife is off to work, and it's very, very hot. I'm going to go into this Starbucks because the air conditioning is amazing. <laughs> and, and write a little bit from the creative well about my life as a hands-on dad. This chapter uh, is called, What's a Threesome? And it's, a, it's about a, 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 a my son. This is not about my son. Sorry about that. <laughs> All I meant to do is say it's not about my son. <laughs> Um, I, I mix fiction with nonfiction, and um, this this boy that you will hear about it does it does not add up to the boy that I have at home. I have a six foot, um, super creative and super social kind of boy, and the boy I'm writing about came was based on this boy before when he had a bowl haircut before he became super studly and ready to take on the world at 15. All right, so here we go. What's a threesome? Alex's first birthday is in Florida. It's 13. Getting him to talk or smile these days is tricky. My wife says he's acting normal for a guy who misses his friends. He's also got some acne, hates the new school and all its rules. Puberty is on him, cramming its heel into every step he takes. I ask him about his classes, new friends, like-minded boys in class, and he says, there's one kid from New York who brags about all the babes he's boned. I remember being my son, resembling him, no cash, big sneakers, zero authority, and an achy yet subtle pain beneath each nipple known as nipple rock. <laughs> Poor guys. <laughs> Poor guy is just arriving, dragged stumbling but steadily into the grip of it all. Half little boy, half werewolf. He's currently most thrown by homework, pop quizzes, the need to stay awake in class, and the distance between himself and his California friends. Today I pick him up and he has a question. He asked me if the verb to bang is the same as to bone. <laughs> My guess is that they're the same. He nods before looking out the window. What's humping? I remember its arrival, sexuality, the symbol of the woman outside bathrooms held new meaning, the forbidden pink beyond her doors. At the mall with my mom in suburban New Jersey, the female mannequins in Bloomingdale's taunted me. Brunettes and strawberry blondes, vixens all pouting and pointing, lost in their urbane and frozen cocktail stares. Then it was magazines. My brother Cam had a pile under his bed. He showed me where they sold them in the back of the 7-Eleven. Penthouse, the 1979 Playmate of the Year, just sitting there on the rack. Raquel Welsh is a statuesque cave woman wearing an animal skin bikini made of rabbit, or was it bear? <laughs> I snuck back to the magazine aisle, nervous looking back at the clerk, his back turned so verboten. I flipped quickly through but saw no nudity, just ads, the Marlboro Man, a cartoon boob, my kingdom for the sight of Raquel's right hip. And then I saw them, both hips, all of her, my very first love. My son's first love is Coca-Cola. If I'm not around, he'll drink three like a longshoreman with a flask. It's something we both like, so we bond over it, seek it out in the bottle form and in those tiny cans. We enjoy the Americana, the old tin signs, the ubiquity of that reddest of reds, no matter where you go. Tuesday, we found Mexican Coke, more syrup, they say, and always in recycled bottles, a connoisseur's favorite. We drank them on our porch. Dad? Yeah. Stephen Hurley is the kid we met in the school office last week. Okay, seemed like a nice kid. He says sperm whales are called that because they have two tons of sperm inside their whale balls. <laughs> uh, bah, thanks for playing. Stephen is wrong. That's not true. My son nodded and blinked a lot. I thought so. Sounds like old Stephen needs to Google sperm whales, I said. He also said the earth will explode soon because of global warming. No, still no. The earth is fine, but it could blow up, just not while we're alive. Yes, maybe, but who cares, right? We won't be here. But someone will, he said, and looked down at his shoes. I rested my hand on his back. No fears, little man. You are safe forever, okay? He looked at me, but then returned to his brain and all its fears. Did I make him pensive, or is it his mother's intellect? Children bring remarkable perspective. You have to raise them well to tap the code. They have to love you to help you, or is the word teach? I absorb his thoughts, place myself among the questions in his mind. I was him. He'll be me. Two mornings ago, he runs into my bathroom while I'm in the shower. I have a pube. <laughs> You have a what, I said? Look. He opened the shower door and, I, and lowered his pants, keeping his t-shirt lifted with his teeth. See it, he mumbled. 
I did, by God. The ending of youth, the beginning of sexuality, the first sign of manhood, or just a tiny brown hair on my little boy Schmeckle. <laughs> see it, Dad? Yup, I do. I see it there. Congrats, buddy. It's the real thing. <laughs> Mom, he yelled. And off he went to show her his manhood without a speck of inhibition. Not the, why, not the way I remember it, I guess. My parents were raised to keep sexuality deep in the annals of live and learn. The internet wouldn't bloom for decades the day I saw my first pube. Dr. Ruth hadn't even said ejaculate on TV. I do have a memory of a book called Where Did I Come From? See the wiggly guys in top hats? They come rocketing out of your urethra and smash into these little ladies here. The eggs in the yellow bonnets. Only one gets through, and it could be you. Yippee, I hear my wife yell from upstairs. Awesome, I do see it. Some applause. <laughs> we were just so happy he was talking to us. <laughs> Finally, the return of Alex. I was so proud of our immunity to the obvious pitfalls parents faced with preteens. I was empowered by the rhythms we'd finally earned. And then it pummeled him. Overnight, it got worse. A hurricane of hormonal shrapnel came chomping at his bone growth and left him pimply and sinister. Life blows, he says. I annoy him. His mother's so lame. My jaw pops when I chew. I only get a friendly tone or word when I buy him Cokes. And he snags it from my hand like an irritated baby gorilla. <laughs> He's depressed, maybe. Angry at his circumstances. Perhaps the school really sucks. I miss him. I think of days not so long ago when I was his hero, his anchor. I will never be as big to him as important as needed. Puberty will beg him to dismiss me. Will I ever lift him again over my shoulder, leaving him giggly just by kissing and squeezing his soft frame, lost in the embrace of my good fortune, being a dad with my only son? Stephen also told me what an orgasm is, he says, his forehead creased with concern. He says it looks like mayonnaise. My mother suggests a book. <laughs> Not that book, some book. We'll give it to him, maybe just leave it in his room, in the bathroom, near his shoes. I buy one for myself, the latest hit, Talking to Him, A Father's Guide to His Son's Questions About Sex. Page three. You are not your son's pal, buddy, or hombre. You may think you are, but you're really not. You're his dad. Will it feel like your old chums at times? Of course it will. But you are not his friend. He needs you in a different way. I find my son in the den. I sit next to him with my new book and watch him play his video game. You winning, I ask, and watch him fire a grenade launcher into a war-torn village. <laughs> not really. Is anyone winning? Dad, yes. I have a question, he says, his headphones muting the explosions on the screen. Okay. Um, what's a dirty Sanchez? <laughs> Um, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean, he says, pausing the game face. I mean, I don't know. A dirty Sanchez? And what's head? <laughs> oh, head. Great. Uh, how do I explain this? I flip to the back of my book as if the explanation is there. <laughs> I saw it on the wall in the bathroom, he says, returning to his game. The restaurant last night, it said, want good head and had a phone number. <laughs> oh, right. Is it a drug? No, no. Head is just... Head is slang for a sex thing. Intercourse? No. It's slang. There's slang for all different types of words. What's a reverse cowgirl? <laughs> I, clo I slowly close my brand new book. <laughs> What's a Ben Franklin, he says? I'm lost. I mean, below the hips in quicksand lost. I smile at him and wonder what a Ben Franklin could possibly be. <clears throat> I envision a naked colonial man in his 60s <laughs> with black knee socks and a kite. <laughs> Will you pause the game, I ask? Why, he says, repeatedly hitting the fire button with the flash of his thumb. I think we should talk. He's willing to walk into his room to speak so his younger sister doesn't hear us and go blind with shock. In our conversation, I learned that my son has not kissed a girl but likes a person named Hannah in social studies. We both learn what constitutes a dirty Sanchez from Google. <laughs> Whole lot worse than I thought. <laughs> After we absorb the definition in our own silent ways, we talk about how different people make different decisions when it comes to their own personal sexual lives. We're getting along wonderfully. Like old war buddies, not his friend, my ass. You and mom have only banged twice, right? <laughs> Yikes, bang, two times, two babies. I see his math. As I ponder the question, he begins to blush, or is it me? He isn't sure if his query is legal, his eyes soft, already apologetic. We've been together more than twice, I say. He thinks about this for a while. Nick Adams said his older brother gave his girlfriend a tuna melt. I don't know what that is, I say. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. Should we Google it? Maxi pad, he throws out. Oh, those are used for menstruation. He looks down into his lap. Can I have a Coke? 
We drive to the 7-Eleven. They have Mexican Coke, so I grab a couple before finding my son staring at the penthouse rack near the cash register. He stands close, but not too close, and then looks at me, but can't see my fra face through the partition. He approaches the rack, and suddenly I'm watching myself in 1979, stealthy, driven, a gnat to a bulb. He places his hand on a magazine. Hey, kid, snaps the clerk. You can't look at that. You gotta be 18. I wasn't, he says, humiliated, scooting away, hoping I didn't hear. Sorry, the clerk says with kindness, it's just the rules. As I move toward them, I see my boy drooping near the exit, a scolded dog. I want to rescue him, erase his angst, lift him from all that he'll endure in this phase of his life. Two in the bottle, I tell the clerk and look down at the penthouse. Three buxom brunettes, arm in arm, wearing blow-up seahorses around their waists. The caption reads, oiling up for summer, a threesome in Maui. I lift it qu quickly, proudly, and flip to the core of it, the centerfold. I open the flap and hold it up for my son. Look, I say, no big secret. Dad, he screams in a whisper, a dip in his knees. I close it fast and place it back on the rack. The clerk and I have eye contact. My son runs from the store, the door is swinging. I feel so stupid, I embarrass him at his most vulnerable. I think of the book I bought, you are not your son's pal, buddy or hombre. You may think you are, but you're really not, you're his dad. Inside the car, he is ready. Why would you do that to me, he says. It was stupid, I apologize. You opened it with the guy right there. I didn't think, I was only thinking of me. Look, I say, holding the Cokes out to him. In a bottle, take one, it's yours, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. His face softens, his eyes pleased. I pop the cap for him and he takes a long sip. Yum, the Mexican kind, he says. I love you, Dad. I love you too, I tell him and bury a kiss into the sweaty brown hair above his ear. Dad, yes. What's a threesome? <laughs> it said a threesome in Maui on the magazine. I find myself sighing as I pull the car out of the lot. I don't know that one, hombre. I just don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So this will be the portion where we ask each other questions that we have not revealed. <laughs> hey, would you like to go first? You go first. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Well, thanks. I haven't heard you uh, read in a while. It was beautiful. Thank you very much. I will be buying. Will there be an audio book? Because I will buy it. <laughs> there will. There will be. Okay. One customer. Yes. <laughs> I discussed observation. You and I came from the same womb. Sometimes we look at each other, there's not a lot of people that uh, laugh the way we do when we're together. Um, so in the, in the realm of observation, you are a writer and an actor. Do you use what you observe uh, in, in a similar way? In other words, when you observe a certain person, and you might, uh, Zach might even say, you wouldn't believe the guy I saw, and then give a little, a, a tiny summary, and of course, he might also say, I gotta, put that I gotta put that character in a film. Yeah, and nine times out of 10, he's in Union Square. <laughs> <laughs> which is great fodder for a writer. So are you utilizing your observations in the physical aspect of acting? You mean when I observe people, do I then put that somehow into an act? Right, because I, I know you do it in writing, so I'm wondering if it transfers to the physical, this is something I don't do in, artistically, is use my body and face to evoke... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, because I'm not so much of a... I mean, I don't really stretch too much as an actor. I mean, I feel like I'm playing... We I think you stretch. No, th thank you, but I, I, I don't... I'm not... You know, I'm I, I'm I don't consider myself the kind of actor that's all of a sudden, you know, um, really be fully becoming someone else like some of the greats uh, do. I think of myself as someone who plays varying versions of of myself. Um, I can do, I, I do that in both drama and comedy, um, and also the people are either uh, nice or 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 more douchey. Um, but I, I'm not someone like Daniel Day Lewis, who's like, now I'm a cobbler in the 1700s. I, I, <laughs> it's just not what I see. You, my, you have not been. I asked. could do it. I could do it if someone asked. 
<laughs> in fact, when I did, a, I was in Oz the Great and Powerful briefly. I was an animated monkey for a lot of it, but briefly, <laughs> I was I was a 1930s like whatever circus hand, and that was kind of the first time I'd done something. Period. And I've done Shakespeare, so obviously that. But I think of it more in my writing. In fact, when I write. I, a dialogue, I kind of do, will play all the characters in a scene. That's kind of the way I write, is that I, I, I don't know anyone else who does this. I've never met someone else who does this, but when I, and maybe you do it, I don't know, but when I write, I sort of have the, I kind of have the conversation out loud myself and play everyone in the scene. And I'll write a long time like that. And sometimes it'll go off on really random long tangents and I'll, I'll obviously have to edit and find out what the core of it is. But that's when I kind of play all different sorts of roles. I can kind of take on someone who completely isn't me um, and become them in order to write them um, and think of what their sense of humor is and a joke they might make or how they'd react. Um, but I think for the bulk of my, my acting experience uh, that were, that's, that's been successful, it's been more sort of variations on on, on who I am, um, on, on, on me. Right. All right, your turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's very exciting. I've never done this before. <laughs> um, do you like writing? <laughs> no, listen, I know it's a funny question, but... I know that you like writing and I like writing when you've written something that you're proud of and you're like, wow, that feels good. But do you like the process of writing? Uh, something that I find incredibly lonesome and hard um, and I dread. I, of course, love it when I've written something I'm proud of, but I dread doing it. And I wonder if you feel the same way. Do you, is it hard to get yourself to do it and in the chair? Uh, and, and do you like it? Okay. Um, I think that there are days where it's better than, than other days. Um, f f um, one of the things I do, and I've been saying this uh, recently, is I want to make sure that the character, whatever that character is who's in that short story or in that novel, is someone I want to see every morning, day in, day out. So your protagonist has to be a sympathetic character to, his, who, to the reader and to you. Um, otherwise, you're not going to want... You're, if I wake up and there is trepidation in returning to what it is that I've already put down, I'm going to have a difficult day and I'm going to be distracted. And that distraction leads to thoughts like, I, I don't have it. I, it, it, there's only one way for the story to come to fruition, and it's not going to come from me. So uh, I'm alone, and um, maybe if I go to the library and sit in a cubicle, or maybe if I, you know, turn on my computer and I and I walk away from the house and I try to get it going. But um, the the sort the the interior arguments that go on between you should you should go face that piece. Um, when that's happening, I re I start to realize that I need to start the piece over. So what is there for me, what kind of excitement and what kind of character is awaiting me since this is a, a day in, day out, years at a time thing, and then it feeds on itself. So that first chapter's done on a Tuesday. I, I got a first chapter done. I can't wait tomorrow to start the morning by reading it and then thinking about that the transition from the end of that chapter into the next one. And also, I like the idea of short chapters. With Daddy Diaries, I really attempt, I was thinking page and a half, you know, and some of them are and some of them are longer. Um, I, I think I, I often uh, come at chapters thinking, let this, this doesn't have to be, this chapter can just be this, and it, and it can have its own beginning, middle, and end, and then look at, the, and, and it transitions well. So, you have told me that you hate writing, and I, I, you said that to me this time, and I said, I thought about it, and I thought, I can't say that I hate it. Why well, don't I, I want to qualify saying that I hate writing? I, my mic sometimes sounds like it's off. Okay, um, I, um, I just find it very hard. So, see, like anything that's very hard, uh, we sometimes dread. Um, but I, uh, I, I find it the of 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 all the several arts that I uh, take on, I find it the hardest. Yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. Um, it can be fun. Yeah. 
You write humor. Does it ever get fun when you're laughing? And yeah, when I'm <laughs> cracking myself up and I'm writing something and, and I go, well, you know, a anyone who's an artist of any kind, uh, you, know, you know when it's good and when it sucks, I think. <laughs> And uh, when it's good, you're, it's the best day ever. And you're like, oh my God, what a high. I just wrote that? Or I just took that photograph? Or wow, I just acted in that scene that felt really, really good? Or I just got, as a director, I just got a performance out of someone that, that, that has the whole crew crying? I mean, that's such a wonderful moment. Um, but when it's not coming and it's not flowing and you're sitting there alone going, oh my God. I'm going to read the Huffington Post again and see if I can stop myself from clicking on that article about the Kardashians. <laughs> um, this is a good segue question. It's my turn. Uh, film is so much about collaboration. Uh, when, I, when I write novels, it's a solitary process. Um, do you prefer the think tank? Um, I don't know if anybody's been on a movie set, but visiting Zach on a movie set, or any director, I would imagine, is, is surreal. He's um, the ringleader, and he's very calm, and he's very funny, and there's, I think there's like, it feels like there's a hundred people at work. Um, my life at work is a little different, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm a library rat, you know, find, find a place to sit. Um, so I guess the question is, do you prefer to work with the think tank over sitting somewhere with your thoughts? Yes, so much more. Sounds like a yes from yeah, the Yeah, that's a very enthusiastic yes. Um, Talk about the collaboration of filmmaking. I love filmmaking because I'm not sitting there alone. It's a, co it's a collaborative art. And for me, I'm going to use a, a, a sort of cheesy analogy or a hokey analogy, but it, it is the most accurate for me. Is that me digging or someone else? I just don't want to be the guy who's digging. Um, it's not me, somebody else. Um, so embarrassing. Um, it's kind of like being the conductor of an orchestra. I'm, I'm not the, gr I'm, the conductor of the orchestra is not the best first violinist. But he gets to hire the best first violinist and then get the best performance out of them. I'm not the best actor in the world. I'm not the best photographer in the world. I'm not the best musician in the world. But I get the joy of hiring all of the best people for this particular project. And then what is my real job? My real job is to pull and encourage and... Um, to direct the best performance out of them, whether it be an actor or a cinematographer or a composer or a or or the ch or, or or the chef at catering, it, it's it's the it, you are the ringleader who says let's all be our best today, and I'm going to shape everyone, and um, and then these wonderful people bring you their ideas. And then it's your decision whether which one you're going to go with. But yes, I, I really, really do prefer that because I love bouncing ideas. I like laughing with other people. A TV comedy room is also very similar. You know, um, for those of you who don't know, TV comedies are written, um, writers go off, but there's a lot of time spent in a giant conference room all sitting around laughing and being very silly with one another. And I, on Scrubs, I'd love that. I would go and sit in the, in the, t in the writer's room and, and just barely laugh with these, you know, 14 people around a table, some of the funniest people ever meet, all pitching jokes for a story that I was going to have the joy of saying those lines. So I really, really love that collaboration. Now, to write your own stuff, to write a feature, uh, that's just not how it works. You have to, you have to, and that's why I think it's so hard, uh, and that's why uh, it, it is the most challenging thing, but the, ultimately the most rewarding when it works. And the script is brought to the set as a blueprint, whereas my work when it's done and you're holding it, it is it is completed. A script always comes to the set with people talking about what what m they might do to, to manipulate it um, because something sounds better today. Um, those hundred people, by the way, that all have their jobs and are moving around and Zach's greeting greeting people and then going to work and then every once in a while it's silence and that you can't you, you don't necessarily see where they're shooting you might have the headphones on so the dance of that is 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 pretty impressive and and uh, there's so much grit behind uh, movies and and music and and literature too um, is it your turn it's my turn oh. um, we have something else in common in that our our first effort, uh, I think, w was both really, really incredibly received. Um, I would say, in my case, uh, I, my second wasn't as re well received. Um, 
and or, or at least on paper didn't do as well. Um, how do you how did how did you um, navigate uh, ones that uh, do better than others, and then how does that inform your future work? I've only done, directed two films, I'm about to direct my third, and I'm asking myself this question, wow, you know, I had this enormous react, wonderful reaction to my first project, uh, a more tepid response to my, my sophomore effort, which is a, a little bit uh, uh, tropey in and of itself, um, um, and then how do I, how, what, what knowledge will I take from, from the combination of those two experiences into my third, and I wonder how that affected your third project. Or second. Or third. Or, well, yeah. well, I meant... Well, let's talk second. I, I, let's talk second. All right, both. Um, sophomore projects, um, you don't, you know, um, you... There, there's a sacrifice in attempting something that may bring no money, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as full-time as I can, and, and I'm also going to be a daddy at home, and I'm going to go to this library each day, and I'm going to bang out something that may or may not be received by the masses. My God. I, don't, I, I, I ask myself... I think that that was pretty br brave and scary, and uh, ev every uh, artist must take a leap like that. It's very embarrassing to come out of a two-year project. Let's say it's a one-year project or a six-month project. You wrote your book, didn't you? All your friends, you know, how was, how'd your book come out? So when you're in there, you want that answer to be, oh, I, I, it's, it's moving through the process. So a, a wave is building. Uh, and then what happened with both our first project was reaction and excitement. And when there's reaction and excitement to something in the beginning, the world is yours, you know. My, my Jacob Green was sent to Steven Spielberg in manuscript form, you know. It doesn't mean anything, um, but it's exciting. And then you build a callus for the next one, which is they're going to tell you lots of good stuff. So second book, Peep Show, it took me forever. I didn't want to, I really didn't want to write something that felt similar to the thing that worked. I really didn't want to, um, you know, be... Uh, uh, pigeonholed in any way. So it took me a long time. Your second project took a long time. If, if our second project had come out maybe quicker, then everyone would say, oh, sophomore slump. But we took like five years or whatever. I'm vi I think I'm very proud of Wish I Was Here, and I'm very proud of Peep Show. And I would say that time heals all wounds, <laughs> and that also to look at where the wounds are coming from. These days, if you have a computer, you are a justified critic, and uh, and you your your opinion in owning that computer is warranted. And well, that is relevant, and actually, in, in when both first projects came out, the the internet was not what the internet is now, and so there were a whole lot. Uh, there is a whole lot more critique of any piece of art, whatever it is, from from fine art. To to the theater, to novels. Uh, so that is relevant a bit, that there's a whole lot more voices uh, in the mix. In, in the movie world, you're done after the first weekend if the, if the numbers weren't good. There was a time, I don't know, if I'm, I'm 47, there was a time where nobody talked about what movies made. I, don't, I, don't, it, uh, I think it might have been the 80s. And, then, or, or then, and then, then I remember Superman was made with Christopher Reeves and they, they were marketing. They were mar there was a product placement and the numbers of how it did were given to the public. Uh, now, you see, it's your business. <laughs> All those businesses is your business. So this is not my way of saying that our second projects were critiqued unfairly. Um, but uh, in a world where, you, where that first weekend is so crucial, uh, in my, uh, there's a couple of great things about books. One is people are still reading them, uh, whether they're, it's on paper or not. And the other is, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So um, when I think about Peep Show and how it didn't have that launch, I love that it's still available to those who might go check it out. Yeah, uh, and so is Wish I Was Here on iTunes. <laughs> In the spirit of 10 minutes, should we take a question or two from the, from the audience, right? Okay, don't be shy. I'll bring them a mic. Uh, the Rangers is, you know, come on, oh, representing. Rangers. Congratulations. 15 puck drop. I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> the question is about observation, actually. Um, because of the internet today and, and new media and TV and film and everything, do you think the young artists today are spending most of their time watching and observing through that instead of real people? Um, have you seen that in trend? Do you have any comments on that? So young people coming up, how, how are they, are, are they, are they sort of saturated with what's feasible through the internet um, as far as critiques? 
you're saying, are they watching m m more media than actually watching real people? And yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. That's a toughie. That's a damn good question. That's a really I don't, good question. I, I think we... Um, ha yeah, how does the young artist... It, it, um, what we do is definitely generational in a sense because Jacob Green, I call it Jacob Green, the unthinkable thoughts of Jacob Green, um, no internet, uh, no... Maybe, maybe that's not right. O4? Maybe, I, I think... <laughs> there was internet in O4. Okay. Internet. No Wi-Fi? Okay, less Wi-Fi. Less Wi-Fi. Wi <laughs> book came out in hardcover. I had to tour it. There was no, there wasn't going to be sold electronically. That's what I'm trying to say. It was not going to be sold electronically. Um, so um, it was paper and pen uh, and some computer and then the first computer had the floppy disks and then you put it in and then you had to bring it out. And um, you should Google the first computers. It was kind of interesting. Anyway. To her question. I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know. That's a very good question, but I don't know if I'm but qualified to answer it. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Next question. Pick here. Anyone you okay. feel You choose. Yeah. The guy in the yellow shirt yeah. looks wise. Hello. <laughs> Not really. Um, I have a question, I guess it probably applies to either of you. Um, what advice would you give, I guess, a young artist coming up, not necessarily like physically making it, but um, like financially, I mean, but like emotionally dealing with, you know, maybe going from something like safe to trying to, you know, make a living artistically. Can you tell me which, which um, genre of, of art you are thinking? Are you an actor? Um, I have acted, but I probably wouldn't, I don't know. So don't when, know. You, when you ask this, are you thinking of, of acting or writing? Writing, writing. Okay. Um, so sorry, just to just hone in, like, what's, what's the question? What, like, what, what advice for, for the young artist going out there in the world today? Emotionally rather than... Emotionally, you're fucked. Um, <laughs> I don't, did you see Robert De Niro just said that to the Tisch students? He, he's like, he ended his speech with, and you're fucked. Um, <laughs> you know, I give speeches at colleges a lot. One thing I said, I was just telling Josh this, I, I, I bring this poster board, I bring a physical uh, board, because I clicked on a song I really liked, just randomly, unknown artist, clicked on a song, you know, like we all do, who is this great song? Maybe I, maybe I shazammed it or whatever, I clicked on it. Song came up, and I could see the first four comments of this of the song, and the, like f f first thing was like five stars. This is music! Exclamation point. Next thing was one star. My poor ears, leave them alone, or something. Next thing was like four stars. Oh my God, new favorite band. Next thing was uh, you should give up now. You suck. <laughs> And I print it up, an unknown band, you know, just side for side. And so I print it up and I show it to, to young aspiring artists and say, this is what you're launching into. It's, it is, you do have to build up a callousness for, uh, for the voice of the internet, the unknown voice of the internet, who no matter what you do, will, will some days love you and some days hate you and all days simultaneously be, be uh, extreme on what they say about you. So the, my, my advice to young artists is to, um, to, uh, to 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 accept that and to be to begin uh, uh, build up a callousness to it and also not let it affect your art. Make the art for the people who are putting the fives and going. Okay, I respond to that. No matter what your art is, you're not going to make your art for everyone. They're just, I mean, you know, we all in this room, we could all go around and say a movie we liked, and someone else would be like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? That's the worst movie I've ever seen. So, uh, but now we all talk about it very vocally. So um, uh, that's it. I would say my best advice would be to know that there, no matter what you do, there's going to be people that are very passionately for you and people that are very passionately against you. And I would say surround yourself with people that support you and, um, and then attempt to become brave around what we're talking about because it's scarier now and if, you know, a sensitive, vulnerable person is going to might, might have a better experience creating something beautiful that has meaning and, and is relative to other people. But that sensitive, vulnerable person has to be able to be told that they suck um, on the, on online. Yeah, and also don't <laughs> read comment sections because they're just horrible. <laughs> yes, in the back there. Um, in Scrubs, yes. uh, you got, or I know that as a, it's a pretty much a third character with the music. The music has a really big influence. Sorry, look um, at his T-shirt. I was no, just that's telling. Yesterday. That's yesterday. I was just telling my brother that Billy Joel sold out the garden and is going for this thing, and you're wearing that stud shirt. Sorry, just yeah. really random. No, it's it's cool. Did he um, open with Angry Man? <laughs> uh, no, he opened with. 
Oh, no, yeah, Gavin McGraw op or was the opener. Oh, cool. But, um, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Okay, I directed yeah. a Gavin McGraw video, but we're, we're jumping all over the place. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> um, with, because I'm really a big fan of music, um, when you guys are writing fan of music. or... Um, or you're just like thinking about a movie. Um, how big is the music? Like, do you have anything that like you go to, or um, is there? Does how much does music play into? In it? my first two films, I, I I really just was using music that I liked, some of the genres that I that I listened to and my friends listened to. Um, I'm about to direct something that's that's about men in their 70s and 80s, uh, so the music will be more of their time, uh, uh, jazz and and uh, and the like. Um, but so for me, um, and what people responded to so, so well with Garden State in particular was uh, music that I find very emotional, music that moves me, music that gives me goosebumps. Um, my editor and I have this sort of running joke when we're cutting a music to a scene. We, you can try your favorite song in the world, but it isn't until we both look and the arm hair is standing on our arms because of the particular marriage of this particular song with this imagery that, that gives us goosebumps th that's how I've done it um, and I was going to say like does it does that song just play in your head as like a scene is going on or sometimes it does sometimes it sometimes it really will sometimes um, I'll go you know with, with, with Garden State that Shin song where she's like the song will change your life I really just heard that song and wow this this song is so powerful to me hopefully enough people will have that reaction to it that this is the perfect candidate for a really romantic, sweet, sharing music moment between these two people. And then sometimes you, I've written songs into scripts, like, and then this song plays as the camera cranes up. And they get in the editing room and it just, it works okay. And then the editor goes, but you know what? If we put this song here, now watch. And then you just have this, you know, you, you know, you know, it's, it, it's visceral. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's how I would answer that. Uh, do you listen to music when you write? I can't oh, when no. I'm writing. No, but I can listen to the, st the milk steamer in Starbucks go off. And <laughs> no, but I see so many people writing with earphones on, and I, I can't do that. It just it, it, the music would definitely guide my guide whatever I was going to write. Maybe if it was like, so maybe much. if there weren't lyrics low in the background, but I've never ever written with music playing. Yeah. Maybe classical. We have to, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, so, Zach, you said that you played uh, characters based on different versions of yourself. a little bit yourself. louder, but I can't hear you. Uh, you said you played characters based on different versions of yourself, and yeah. Josh, your book is based on you know your move from San Francisco to Florida, which I'm born and raised in Florida, so I apologize for all the craziness that goes on down there. But um, how do you draw the line between you know realism and fiction when you're creating a story? How do you draw the line between realism and fiction when you create a story? I completely interweave them. I mean, there's there's aspects of my stuff that is uh, completely me, um, and then there's stuff I just completely make up. Um, um, in Garden State, um, you know, uh, there was so much of me about being sort of lost and 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 having a quarter life crisis of my own. I put so much of myself into it. Um, but that character, you know, couldn't have a more dysfunctional relationship with his parents. I have an incredible relationship with my parents. Um, in Wish I Was Here, um, we, I combined a lot of, with my, uh, with my other brother Adam, we, we combined a lot of aspects of our lives, but then completely made stuff up. More than anything, it's what I'm feeling, and then a lot of the little things, a lot of the little minutia. You know, in, in Garden State, I really did have those headaches, and I did go to a neurologist, and I remember thinking, God, if this guy has one more diploma, it's going to need to go on the ceiling. In <laughs> um, which I was here, uh, I used to wear these contacts for like months, and, and then I would throw them away. And I remember thinking, as I would flush them away, God, think how, how much I've seen through those contacts over the last three months, and here I am just throwing them in the toilet. Uh, and then I, so I scribbled down like a guy who saves all his contacts because it's everything he ever saw. Um, so it's a lot of the coloring and the moments that are really, really, truly from my life and the feelings, uh, the emotion. Um, but in terms of plot, is a, lo a lot of it is, is made up for me. We have time for one more before one we more get to question. signing some books. Yeah. And then Josh is going to sign books for y'all. Hi. Sorry. I have a question that can apply to either. Um, it's the idea of like downloading in this generation, I guess. So for like films and stuff, 
do you mind that people are downloading them now as opposed to paying to watch them if people are still seeing them? Or would you prefer that it gets recognised financially, I guess, or like... And then the same with books, with like, people can download them online and just read it. Do you mind that they're able to read it or would you prefer people to pay for it? Well, of course you prefer people art. to pay it for it. I didn't realise people weren't paying for my book. <laughs> <laughs> We're really unhappy right now. Uh, you just you just bummed him out for the whole night. Oh, um, do you know what college costs? <laughs> you can't control it uh, really uh, when it comes. You know, the second your film comes out in theaters, the the second it comes out, it's all over BitTorrent. If you're if you're unlucky, it's out before it's in the theaters if it, if it leaks. So it's not really something you control. What's what's sad and weird is that the the, the generation coming up now doesn't really have a a, a, a a conscience problem about it. They they sort of feel like they're owed the music, they're owed everything um, without a cost. There isn't a there isn't a thought like well like we had like. Like, oh, I'm stealing that. I, I, I always had that. Maybe it's because I'm an artist, or maybe because I, we were raised when you actually had to physically buy stuff. But, um, but um, so I think you just have to rely on hopefully enough people will do the right thing, um, and that there are enough people out there with a, a good conscience about it. Didn't uh, you see Garden State for sale on the street in New York? Yeah, and I, I no down in, on Canal Street, a woman. You know how those people have all the DVDs lined up. And this was when Garden State came out, so it was more likely not stolen like off a digital, I mean, it definitely wasn't a digital copy, it was like video camera in the movie theater, you know, heads walking by. <laughs> and I remember I was just so livid at this woman. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, I, you, I think you said shame. I said shame on you. <laughs> and now there's no chance in hell this woman spoke any English. <laughs> and she didn't know why I was saying shame on you. But she heard you. But I had to say it to her. She's, she's probably changed everything. And then I bought a copy of another movie she had. No. <laughs> um, well, Joshua, I have one question for you. Yes. I'm, I, I didn't read the book yet. I'm waiting for the signed copy to go home and start it tonight. But I saw in one of the plots they said that you have a narcissistic brother. And I was wondering if you modeled it after any of your family members. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would like to say that that's a very brave question, <laughs> and I've been asked it before, but the, um, here's the answer. The character who's the narcissistic brother in The Daddy Diaries, um, I, when I was writing that scene, that character had to be an older brother. And um, it's... I, I, when, when, and then Zach was reading it and said, hey, is... Are you thinking about me here? Because uh, when well, I I I, I didn't never I never really thought it was me to be honest. And I said, "Am I the Josh Gad guy?" <laughs> Am I? Yeah. And then he said, "A third. <laughs> I was a fraction." Yeah. Well, I mean, you take pieces. You know, I'm sure there's probably there's there's pieces uh, in it. But no, I didn't. I. It's funny because we always get those questions like, "Oh, is that you? I oh, is that, that oh, oh, is that your son? Oh, is that your brother?" And you know, there's flavors. But uh, I even. And then it was funny because we had, the, we had this reaction with each other, even though we've laughed about getting that before. I never really thought, like, even though in his book there is a, a successful kind, of, right, kind of a dickhead brother, <laughs> I never thought I was the successful dickhead brother. One, one time you Maybe ordered, that's because I'm a narcissist. One time... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, would visit, we would visit in L.A. and he'd say, this is the only sushi place you can go to and we went and he ordered so I was excited that he ordered but I think I might have this guy in the daddy diaries starts ordering for his younger brother oh there you go well I will I will order for you guys if we ever go to sushi together he's really good at I'm ordering really really good at it <laughs> there were truff there were truffles in this there sushi. were truffles alright Th thank you thank you thank, thank you all so thank much you for guys. coming thanks